afternoon, um, we are going to be talking about, about joy, joy in our practice. This was not something I thought up myself, this was something which was suggested as Tushita. But when I uh, read their suggestion, I thought, oh, what a good idea. <laughs> So I'm not quite sure what we're going to talk about, but um, I did think that maybe I would uh, give it a rather heretical subtitle of In Praise of a Healthy Ego. <laughs> Buddhism. Well, as almost all of you know, <laughs> um, the uh, Buddha taught his first sermon after his enlightenment in a place called Saranath, which is near to Varanasi. And although he had just, you know, within the last few weeks attained to enlightenment, which he had been striving for for countless eons. Um, Aileen, can you get Lona in here? She's sitting outside. The shop's still open. Um, and so he must have been incredibly blissful after all those eons and eons of striving. Finally. He had broken through all those deep, thick fetters of ignorance, and he had, he had become the truth. He had become a Buddha. What could be more fantastic than that? What could be more utterly liberating and blissful than that? But as we know, his first sermon, what he talked about mostly was a thing called Dukkha which means in English, uh, it's usually translated as suffering, uh, but it also has an idea of dissatisfaction or dis-ease. So, therefore, because every, mostly people know that the Buddha's first sermon was about suffering, and then he goes on to talk about other really jolly things like death and impermanence and the fact that we don't have any self anyway. People tended to label, in the West, people tended to label Buddhism pessimistic. But, of course, Buddhism is not pessimistic. They were also very puzzled by, since Buddhism is such a pessimistic religion, there's no God, there's no self, there's all this talk about the hell realms and death and impermanence and suffering. How come that in Buddhist countries, people look so cheerful? Even in my Tibetan dictionary, which was written by a one of the early uh, Christian missionaries, he points out that the Tibetan people are cheerful, honest, good-natured, and, and so forth, and a very happy lot. But, of course, how much happier they would be if they had the true message of Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and he's clearly puzzled why they should be cheerful, happy, and, and, and so forth. So, th this is what we're going to talk about. Now, if you take the Four Noble Truths, as we know, the first truth is the truth of the dissatisfaction of our ordinary 
life. I'm not going to go on a lot about Four Noble Truths, but we get in perspective. So, he said, birth, he starts with birth. Now, mostly in the West, we think birth is a time of rejoicing, not dukkha. Of course, it's dukkha for the mother. <laughs> and we have to remember that when the child comes out, it doesn't laugh. <laughs> It yowls. It's considered healthy. <coughs> Birth, old age, sickness, death. Getting what we don't want, not getting what we do want. So if we think about that, that covers a very wide range. What the ego wants, so often doesn't get, and we suffer. What we don't want, we often do get, and so on. So. And the point is, we never know when or where. Today, we are happy, we are healthy, we have lots of money, we have a nice partner, everything's wonderful. Tomorrow, we discover we have some incurable disease, our partner leaves us, the stock market crashes, and suddenly, from being up here, we're down there. We don't know. We really don't know. It's like a circle. So sometimes we're up, sometimes we're down. Samsara is compared to an ocean. An ocean has waves. Waves go up, waves come down. Go up, come down. And as long as we grasp only at that which gives to us a sense of satisfaction and are in denial of that which goes against what I want, we suffer. Okay, first noble truth. Second noble truth, the Buddha treated it like a, a good physician, like a good doctor, right? He said, okay, you're sick. You're really sick. But unlike Indian doctors, he didn't just hand you a pill and throw you out. He told you why you are sick. Why are we sick? Right? He gave the cause of the sickness, and then he said, there is a cure. This this sickness has a cure, and this is the, the remedy. Follow this regime, this remedy, take these pills, you will recover from your sickness because it is only a passing sickness. It's not, you're, you are not incurably sick of a life. So, if you look at the Four Noble Truths in that way, they are not at all pessimistic. It's the most optimistic message which was ever given. It is, first of all, very realistic. It's not saying this is the best of the best of the best of all possible worlds. It's saying, no, right now, in our ignorance, we suffer. But there's a reason. Now, what is the reason? The reason that we suffer is because, because we cling. We cling to things, we cling to people, thinking that if we have lots of possessions, if we have a really genuine relationship, 
somehow that will be, make us feel good. Then we'll feel better. It will be okay, if only. But the real reason why we cling to things outside of ourselves, people outside of ourselves, is because of our fundamental ignorance of clinging to a very false identity of who we are. This is the fundamental tenet of all Buddhism, and it is very difficult sometimes for people to understand what is being said. When we read just boldly, the Buddha said there is no self. People say, oh, come on. Of course I've got a self. You know? I made your you. Obvious. And spiritual people say, the Buddha was denying a soul. But our soul is um, a spark of the divine, a spark of God. So therefore, the Buddha was an atheist. And that doesn't feel quite right either. So, when the Buddha said, there is no self, suffering, the fact that things are unsatisfactory, I mean, most people know in their life that everything is really okay if only. But there's always an if only. I'd be all right if only something changed. If only something happened. But basically, the idea of the non-satisfactoriness of our ordinary existence, most people appreciate. Most people can understand impermanence. Once you start looking at it, you recognize, as science tells us, that everything is, is moment to moment moving, nothing is ever still. Looks like very solid, but we all know from the point of quantum physics that this is a whole different thing from how it looks here, right? So, I mean, even backed up by science, we know that everything is constantly in movement. Nothing is still. Everything is impermanent. Rising, falling, rising, falling, monk, 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 monk. And the mind also is racing along. Our thoughts coming up, going, thoughts coming back, like a movie. It's like a movie where you see on the screen, you know, that there is something being played out there. But actually, it's just lots of little transparent frames which are moving so fast with the light behind them that it projects this reality. But this reality is based on the fact that these, these, these frames are moving at an incredible pace. Most people can understand that. If you sit down and think about it, Fair enough, yes, everything's impermanent. I am not the person I was today insofar as my body's changed. I'm obviously not a baby anymore. I'm not a little child. I'm mature. I'm middle-aged. I'm old. We, we can all see that. Houses are beautiful. Ten years' time, they need to be repainted. We all know that. But what gets people, at least people in the West, is the teaching on no self. And I, I want to explain that a little bit. I hope this gentleman in front of me is not a geshe. Um, uh, and, and, and try to, to make sense of it. First of all, the word that the Buddha used in, uh, in Pali and, or in Sanskrit is um, Anatman. Now, 
Atman in classical Sanskrit means I. I think at the time of the Buddha, which was about 600 BC, the idea of Atman as <laughs> the idea of Atman as being a vast cosmic principle and one with Brahman as taught in the Upanishads was not extent. If it was, it was not much talked about. If one reads the early sutras, the Pali Canon, the Buddha there, um, he debates many different views which were extant in India at his time. And nowhere in all that does he mention anything about this this unity of Atman and Brahman. In fact, the kind of Hinduism, well, it wasn't Hinduism in those days, Brahmanism that he is refuting or discussing stems from the Vedas and from some uh, philosophy. And one could say, well, uh, the Buddha himself being a Kshatriya, uh, that means the warrior caste, he didn't know about these higher teachings, which were only kept among the Brahmins. But many of his chief disciples, including Shariputra and Mughalyana, were Brahmins. Mahakashapa, many, many were Brahmins who had been going around to many teachers, but also they do not mention anything about this idea of a more cosmic Atman. And so, therefore, I at least am left thinking that when the Buddha said an Atman, he was not directly refuting the present day uh, Vedantic interpretation of Atma, which he didn't know. He was refuting the idea we have of I, of self, of me. Not something beyond this ordinary identity. Okay? Now, let's think about that. Anatman is refuting the idea of an unchanging I. An unchanging I. Which actually we in our heart of hearts all hold to. The idea that somehow I do not change. That the child that I was, the adult into old age, somehow that's still me. And that sense of I is there at the back of almost all that we are thinking. I like ice cream. In my opinion, you know, this, this hole should be bigger. Um, I, I come from Israel, I come from uh, Tibet, wherever. I am a male, I am a female. I am intelligent, I am pretty dumb. Whatever. Everything which we do is predicated on this sense of that there is at the center of it all an autonomous, unchanging, solid being or soul called me. Right? Because we all think I. 
Well, in my opinion, I think, oh, I remember when I did that. Well, I'm planning to do something else. Oh, well, I've always been like this. Oh, I have the idea of doing this. I, 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 I. Everything revolves around I, as the Buddha said. To each one, his own self is most dear. And that, that sense of a solid, immutable, unchanging eye, like a spider in the middle of the web, that is what the Buddha denied. He said, look for it, you'll never find it. Now, he did not say that we don't exist. Obviously we exist. But we don't exist how we think we exist. This is the problem. We have a totally distorted idea of who we really are. And, and this is what creates the problem. Because if we have a, a sense, strong sense of an individual I which has to be protected and satisfied, then we are always reaching out to grasp at something beautiful and bring it to I, and, and pushing off something which we think is unpleasant. Right? So that's how we get this, this whole round of, of ego ignorance, and then with, along with that, greed and grasping to satisfy this I, and, and the aversion and anger to get rid of anything which gives displeasure to this I. Right? So, therefore, the ultimate problem is the I. <coughs> okay? You're wondering what this has got to do with joy. <laughs> Now there is good news here. <coughs> because Buddhism recognizes that the root of all our problems is grasping at a sense of identity, a sense of ego, which ultimately does not exist and is blocking the light of what does exist, which is so much greater than that. Therefore, in Buddhism, on the whole, the ego gets a very bad rap. And it is always being um, bashed on the head. Now, on one level, this is good, but on another level, it doesn't quite work. Leaving aside Madhyamaka, which some of you must have been studying, if you come to the Yogacara system, it will make it more clear. In the Yogacara system, or the Chittamatrin system, which was um, associated with, with Asanga and Vasubandhu. There are eight consciousnesses. Okay, this is not, this is not an intellectual um, discussion, but uh, the, you, we need to understand this. There are eight consciousnesses. So the first five consciousnesses are um, the sense consciousnesses, eyes, ears, nose, mouth, uh, taste and touch. Because if we have no senses, then we will not have, uh, if we have no consciousness, then even though we have eyes and ears, there will be no um, impact. And then, and then we, the sixth consciousness, which is mind, will not then be able to interpret the data which is coming through the, six, the, the other five senses consciousnesses, right? So this is very basic Abhidharma. Right, so you have the five sense consciousnesses, 
you have the sixth consciousness, which is the thinking mind, which then gets all these together, and is what we usually are involved in, all our thoughts, feelings, memories, anticipations, intellectual uh, ruminations, and so forth. That's all the sixth consciousness, right? It's a conceptual consciousness. That means that by its very nature, it's dualistic. There is a thinker and a thought. And it can only think on its own level, which is a conceptual level of things which can be seen and things which can be tasted and touched. Okay? Now, so you're on the sixth consciousness. Then we skip that and we go to the eighth consciousness. Now, the eighth consciousness is a very interesting consciousness. This is called in Sanskrit the Alaya Vijnana. And in um, Tibetan, it's called the, the Kunji, which means the all base. And in English, it's translated in various ways. Alaya means store. So, like you have him, Alaya, right? A storehouse of snow, right? The Himalaya. And so here, the uh, Vijnana Alaya is the uh, consciousness storehouse. It's a storehouse of all consciousness. And in the Yogacara system, it is like, you might almost say like you have an ocean, right? And then you have the waves on top of the ocean, which is our ordinary sixth uh, conceptual consciousness. And then all these feelings, thoughts, and all the intentional actions of body, speech, and mind, our karma, sink to the bottom of the ocean. And then you have this huge ocean bed in which everything resides. It's like a computer program, you know, a huge computer base, database. And, and this is where they explain how something which you memorized yesterday, you remember today since the sixth consciousness is momentary. How is it that we can memorize anything? How is it we remember what we did when we were four years old? It's because it's all stored down in this big database. Plus all our karma, our body, speech and mind, all like seeds are all stored there. And when the causes and conditions come, they rise to the surface. Right? This is another talk on karma. But this is where, in, in the uh, Chitta Matra system, this explains how all we have memories not only of this lifetime, but of past lifetimes. How? Because it's all stored. As I say, like a computer, a computer can store zillions and zillions of bits of uh, data, you know? And it only comes together when the, you, know, you push the right buttons, and then up it comes. It's all there. So, 